Tina, you are a leading independent consultant and the founder of Fordham Global Foresight. Uh, you've been advising CEOs, investors, three-star generals, the United Nations, and many other people. And for the last 25 years, uh, you have been working on the intersection of geopolitics, business, and the drives of social change. Yeah. And very recently, you've been named one of the most influential women in finance. So congratulations. Thank you. Now, just a few weeks away from the U.S. presidential elections, I think one of the most important events in the political calendar. You've been following it for the last five U.S. elections. Yeah. And I recall in 2016 how you warned us. You warned us about the polls. Can we go yeah. back to that and yeah. what you were thinking? Yes, well, we, we always knew that 2024 was going to be a big year for global elections with more than half of the people on the planet going to, to vote and the U.S. elections uh, in November really being the, the kind of centerpiece. And now it's only a few weeks away. And so we're looking at the polls and one of the striking things is just how close they are and how stable they are. They're just not budging, and that in itself is unusual. Um, and I think, you know, almost whatever aspect we talk about in this year's U.S. elections, we kind of have to rip up the old playbook um, when we, you know, when we look at them, because um, it's clearly not the economy stupid, uh, as was famously said by James Carville, who was Bill Clinton's campaign strategist right. back in the late 90s, because the U.S. economy is the envy of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, Americans may not be feeling great about it because of inflation, especially, you know, cost of living on on basic goods. But the U.S. economy is uh, performing very well. Uh, the, we have a, a bull market. Um, and yet the incumbent, uh, President Biden, who of course, withdrew from the race, saw his approval ratings in the tank. Yes. And so that correlation, such as it was, um, it has broken down. Uh, and the, the dramatic developments over the summer with uh, Biden withdrawing from the race after his disastrous performance, um, the first assassination attempt against President Trump, uh, and then Harris rising to the top of the ticket with her running mate, Tim Walls. And we're in this place where the polls are stuck. So an enormous amount of drama over the summer. And now that we're in the home stretch, the divide is just two percentage points with Harris in the lead. But what's interesting about this race, well, there are many things that are interesting about it, is if you look at investor perspectives, investors have gone back to where they were in June or so, which is all in for Trump. And you can see the disconnect in the prediction markets, which I have to kind of highlight have historically been prone to uh, intervention and manipulation. And it only recently became legal again in the United States to, to invest in the prediction markets. But investors seem to have decided that uh, Trump is the more likely winner. The tiny lead that Harris has has got Democrats feeling very anxious. Yeah. And, and what it means for all of us observers is um, a polling error in either direction, you know, could see a victory. And that means even a one point shift uh, in the battleground states or the swing states. Swing states, of course. Yes. Seven swing states, so there's very little in it. And you mentioned inflation. Can I pick your brain? Of course, there's been some interesting discussions around Federal Reserve appointments and the independence of the Federal Reserves. What's your thinking there in terms of the, the candidates? Well, you know, we can only um, observe the policies that that they uh, that they announce in in the campaign. Um, and one of the developments that I think hasn't gotten as much attention uh, as it might have is the idea uh, that Trump first mentioned in uh, one of the debates where he said he thought the president, meaning him, should have um, a view, should be able to have a view on interest rates. Now, you know, we know that, that Trump is a, a real estate guy and interest rates matter a lot for, for real estate, and he does indeed have very strong views about it. But the, um, the concept has been developed further since, uh, and there have been some articles about it. And what will be interesting for, for any of your um, viewers here in the UK is that it, it appears that they want to have something modeled on um, what we have 
here in, in Britain, which is like a shadow chancellor type of role, um, which I guess gives it a, a veneer of, you know, kind of um, uh, political acceptability. It's not clear how it would work in, in practice to have a president ha who had a role in, um, uh, in, in setting central bank policy. Yep. Um, but at the moment, it doesn't seem to be bothering markets. I think if Trump were to win, you would see a lot more effort to understand what this might mean. But of course, it would be a, a you know a huge change in uh, in in policy and in in practice too. There's been some big developments, of course, this week in in the Middle East, and you often mentioned a new geopolitical risk super cycle, the convergence of a structural increase in conflicts, of course, the maximum number of the historically of the number of elections in one single year, and fewer buffers to mitigate those risks. Yep. Um, how are the developments in the Middle East changing the trajectory of, of what we were uh, expecting? Well, the the geopolitical risk super cycle thesis uh, is something that I wrote over um, over a year ago, about eighteen months ago. So before um, the latest escalation in the Middle East conflict, yep. the October seventh attacks actually happened. And you know, you you summarized it very well. The the conceptual foundation of this thesis is that the drivers of geopolitical risk um, continue to accelerate, and that's everything from the number of elections and, and possible changes in, in government to uh, more structural uh, themes or even um, you know climate change events that translate into factors like uh, more migration, yeah. uh, more conflict. We can see this in the data. The International Crisis Group shows that since 2012, there has been an increase in the number of conflicts, the duration of conflicts, et cetera. Um, the purpose of international institutions like the United Nations or central banks, the IMF and the World Bank, of course, is to try to, to mitigate and moderate the impact of these kinds of developments. Um, but they have less backing and um, less, uh, there's less international cooperation. So we're seeing what the, what the implications of that uh, is, and that's more risk events. More risk events. And of course, yeah. you know, where we are on LSEC and FTSE Russell, yeah. we capture all this data. We're yes. very good in data analytics. We look at uh, the Russell 2000, FTSE right. 100, the China yes. A50. Um, well, so you're going to be asking, how do we see this in the data? And and, 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 and this is a question that, um, that I have very often throughout the course of my career. So linking it back to the Middle East conflict, um, this is the, you know, the biggest instance of escalation in the Middle East since 2006. Yes. But in contrast to to that period, the impact on, on oil prices has been um, modest to negligible. About two weeks ago, we had a, a relative spike because we've had this cycle of escalation between Israel and Iran that um, is getting more serious uh, with the suggestion that Israel might attack Iran's nuclear facilities, which would be a massive risk event yep. that has since uh, receded to perhaps attacks on, on military installations. But if there was an attack on uh, Iran's energy facilities, or indeed, if we look at the Ukraine conflict, if Ukraine were to attack Russia's energy um, in infrastructure, which it has done some of, um, in either case, there would be um, a, an impact on markets. And when we talk about geopolitical risk um, at the first order, we're talking about uh, systemic impact. And that means either through the commodities price channel or in the form of a growth shock. So when I talk to you know people who are on the, on the younger side, they say geopolitical risk, we don't see it, doesn't really matter. Tragic and concerning, but no market impact. What I would suggest is to have two uh, global conflicts, both of which can be uh, potentially become systemic. First of all, it, it, we haven't been in this place um, at any time in the last couple of decades. Uh, and again, if you know my um, analysis of the buffering factors, international institutions and uh, financial institutions is is correct. If these conflicts were to get out of control there would be an impact on markets. But the next point I would make is that it isn't just 
the direct market impact. Usually geopolitics has uh, more pronounced second and third order effects. And so that can be things like risk aversion, um, or also in the Middle East case, uh, the supply chain impact. I work with a lot of corporates uh, and they are definitely feeling the impact from the disruptions in the Red Sea, uh, a, a byproduct of the conflict in the Middle East. So we shouldn't take an overly narrow view of why this uh, level of heightened geopolitical risk matters or doesn't matter for markets. It's, it's very much influencing the environment. And it can be through different transition mechanisms, yeah. indeed the uh, commodity prices, effects markets, of course. Yeah, currency markets are the are, are the, the quickest. The uh, quickest way. Yeah, to uh, respond to. to respond to and then equity markets. And, yeah. and, and of well, equity markets are the least sensitive yeah. to geopolitical risk. But I would argue that because of the way, you know, that equity markets work, um, that there is nevertheless that impact in terms of risk appetite. But you, you speak indeed to, to CEOs, CIOs. Do you notice a difference between the people in Europe versus the US? Yeah. How they think about risk? Do they think about risk in terms of a central case and mm -hmm. maybe a base case and then a downside? Or, or how, how yeah. do they talk about in terms of yeah. your framework? Well, it depends on who you're talking to, okay. right? So if you're talking to a head of trading, yeah. you get a different conversation than with a, a CIO um, or a CEO. And as you suggested, there are definitely regional differences and um, generational differences, right? So, you know, a 40-year-old head of trading um, tends to be quite dismissive um, uh, about geopolitics. Not only that, but uh, about elections. I spoke to one head of trading at a European bank who said, I'm not worried about U.S. elections. If Harris wins, um, you know, there'll be more spending and that'll be inflationary. Well, in fact, of course, the Congressional Budget Office has scored the policies of the two candidates, and it's Trump's that are more inflationary. But that's what I meant about the, the old-fashioned um, perspective, mm -hmm. just kind of going on the, uh, you know, the kind of um, stereotypical view of Democrats and Republicans m might leave some market participants unprepared for the extent to which, you know, Old is new and change is, is a, a goal in itself. And nobody's really sticking to the historic policy positions. Yep. Harris needs to distinguish herself from her boss, Joe Biden. And her way of doing that appears to be kind of finding a middle ground between Biden's positions and, and Trump's. Um, but it seems to me that one of the almost coping mechanisms for investors in, in more you know, geopolitically influenced times is to tune it out. Yes. If you can't see the direct impact on the asset class that you look at or, you know, the stock that you're trading, it's noise. I think there is something in between the signal and noise construct and the base case and, and tail risk idea. We've talked about this before. You know that I advise my clients to think in terms of plausible hypotheticals. Yes. And that means a 20% probability event. I mean, those happen every day. They happen all the time. Yes. Uh, but the view by most investors tends to be, unless you're telling me it's 90%, I'm not going to plan for that. I mean, I'm simplifying quite a bit. Of course. But that 2016 election that you're, you're talking about, I mean, I, I think I was the only kind of sell-side research analyst on the street saying that it's, it is very plausible that Trump wins. Um, nobody had it as a base case, uh, but the investors that I had talked to about that were at least less surprised, and that's why the you know the motto for Fordham Global Foresight is uh, from Louis Pasteur: "Fortune favors the brave, um, but chance favors the prepared mind." And it's why I think the plausible hypotheticals construct is a more useful way than base case and tail risk. Because we're talking about even nuclear conflict has more than a tail risk uh, chance of, of happening. And even if the risk is small, yes. if the consequence is disastrous, uh, yes. that, that by itself of right. course, should adjust people's uh, risk framework. Yeah. Can we switch to manipulation? Because we, you mentioned work at, at, at the beginning. Now, FBI Director Christopher Wray uh, named uh, effectively rogue states interfering yeah. in the 2024 elections. And a report, 2019 report, mm -hmm. bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee report, 
found actually evidence yeah. of uh, false reports and uh, trolls, conspiracy theories. Yes. Exactly. So, yeah. so how do you think about uh, social media mm. and the potential for manipulation in in in, in your world of uh, geopolitical analysis? Well, we always knew that in um, in an election where the global consequences are so significant, um, the potential for for foreign for external intervention was going to be high. Yeah. Um, and and this has been the case for the last couple of elections. But of course, social media means that these efforts can really take place on steroids. And it's extremely difficult to trace and to track uh, what the impact is. We saw this in this country with the uh, the far right riots, you know, that were supposedly about immigration. The role of social media there, disinformation and misinformation, a bit different from the manufactured stuff, um, and it is an enormous worry. And I. I think sometimes that it, it, that it's not as clear as it might be why interfering in elections is so significant. And I would I would put it this way: because doing so undermines our faith in in institutions. institutions yeah. And if people don't believe that um, that they you know these institutions are legitimate, they don't believe in the outcome. They don't trust their neighbors and and their you know fellow citizens at the moment in the United States we have record low trust in the media that's not not so new but on a related point we have record low trust in the Supreme Court and that matters considering that the Supreme Court might have to adjudicate uh, in a close race or if there are recounts and, and everything else um, so I feel like there's a lot of denial going on. And the other element that I think is el elusive about this um, foreign interference in elections is why would why would they do that? Why would Russia or China or North Korea or Iran um, interfere in U.S. elections? And we we know that there was external interference in in the Brexit referendum and elsewhere. In the case of U.S. elections, um, it's pretty simple uh, because casting doubt on democracy as a desirable um, system is very much in the interest. The house uh, divided cannot stand. Yes, but. yes. And casting doubt is um, a much lower cost way of projecting power, which after all is what geopolitics is. It's projecting power. It's not current events. Um, then going to war. Yes. And, and so it's cost effective. Yes, it's cost Time it's effective. Low, relatively low risk doesn't trigger a military response and big rel impact. relatively low cost and causes people to doubt um, uh, you know each other uh, and and the system and so with that in mind it seems to me it's it's only likely to become uh, something that's used more often and we need to get smarter about it I mean you know our kids are being taught in school how to identify, misinformation and disinformation. And I wish, you know, my aunts and uncles and cousins and people on, on Facebook had this training because you can see how quickly it's disseminated. Yes. Now, in this year, we're talking about, we're talking about uh, U.S. elections. What else are you monitoring? Uh, of course, this is the big event that, that everyone is focused on, but... but do, I, do I have to be doing more than that, uh, the most important event? I mean, conflicts are, are very much yeah. front of mind and um, how to how to think about them uh, from a business and investment perspective, try to identify where they might go and the trajectory of escalation. But still, the outcome of the U.S. elections matters a lot. And we spoke earlier about regional differ differences. Um, one of the facts is that being here in Europe as we are, um, we're very exposed to what might happen next in the Ukraine conflict. So if U.S. funding for um, uh, Ukraine is um, stopped or ceased or paused or, or whatever might happen, uh, the question becomes, can Europe do more? Can Europe take responsibility for security on the European continent as a whole, which of course has been shared by NATO for quite a long time? And that's a huge question, especially when we look at this state of political stability in the two 
biggest EU member states, France and Germany, um, and um, the inroads, you know, being made in other European Union states that are um, amount to blocking support for Ukraine. And of course, in the U.S., there's a much more active dispute about, you know, is it in U.S. interests or values? So conflict is the quickest route to disruption. The other um, means that we discussed, like intervention in, you know, in uh, via social media and disinformation, are less pronounced, but also quite disruptive. And the bottom line is, you can't just look at your P and L and predict what's going happen. Absolutely. And uh, of course, we will closely be monitoring all the developments through the Navigator. And for those uh, who haven't been following uh, Tina yet, you can go on Spark and follow her uh, Navigator regularly. And with that, I will come to an end. I'd like to thank you for the exchange of thought. Fantastic talking to you. Thank, thank you thank for you very having much. me. 